So how can Claude represent multiple perspectives on a thing? Like, is that is that challenging? We could talk about politics. It's a very divisive, uh, but there's other divisive topics, baseball teams, mm -hmm. sports, and so on. Yeah. How is it possible to sort of empathize with a different perspective and to be able to communicate clearly about the multiple perspectives? I think that people think about values and opinions as things that people hold sort of with certainty and almost like like preferences of taste or something, like the way that they would, I don't know, prefer like chocolate to pistachio or something. Um, but actually I think about values and opinions as like a lot more like physics than I think most people do. I'm just like, these are things that we are openly investigating. There's some things that we're more confident in. We can discuss them. We can learn about them. Um, and so I think in some ways, though it, like it's ethics is definitely different in nature, but it has a lot of those same kind of qualities. You want models in the same way that you want them to understand physics. You kind of want them to understand all like values in the world that people have and to be curious about them and to be interested in them and to not necessarily like pander to them or agree with them because there's just lots of values where I think almost all people in the world, if they met someone with those values, they would be like, that's abhorrent. I completely disagree. Um, and so again, maybe my, my thought is, well, in the same way that a person can, um, like I think many people are thoughtful enough on issues of like ethics, politics, opinions that even if you don't agree with them, you feel very heard by them. They think carefully about your position. They think about its pros and cons. They maybe offer counter considerations. So they're not dismissive, but nor will they agree. You know, if they're like, actually, I just think that that's very wrong, they'll like say that. I think that in Claude's position, it's a little bit trickier because you don't necessarily want to like, if I was in Claude's position, I wouldn't be giving a lot of opinions. I just wouldn't want to influence people too much. I'd be like, you know, I forget conversations every time they happen, but I know I'm talking with like potentially millions of people who might be like really listening to what I say. I think I would just be like, I'm less inclined to give opinions. I'm more inclined to like think through things or present the considerations to you um, or discuss your views with you. But I'm a little bit less inclined to like um, affect how you think because it feels much more important that you maintain like autonomy there. Yeah, like if you really embody intellectual humility, the desire to speak decreases quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but Claude has to speak. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but without being um, overbearing. Yeah. And then, but then there's a line when you're sort of discussing whether the earth is flat or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I actually was... Uh, I remember a long time ago was was speaking to a few high profile folks and they were so dismissive of the idea that the earth is flat, mm -hmm. but like so arrogant about it. And I, I thought like, there's a lot of people that believe the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. That was, well, I don't know if that movement is there anymore. That was like a meme for a while, Yeah, uh, but they really believed it. And like, what? okay, so I think it's really disrespectful to completely mock them. I think you st you have to understand where they're coming from. I think probably where they're coming from is the general skepticism of institutions, mm -hmm. which is grounded in a kind of, there's a deep philosophy there, which you could understand, you can even agree with in parts. And then from there, you can use it as an opportunity to talk about physics without yeah. mocking them, without so on, but it's just like, okay, like what, what would the world look like? What would the physics of the world with the flat earth look like? There's a few cool videos on this. Yeah. And then, and then like, or is it possible the physics is different and what kind of experience would we do? And just, yeah, without disrespect, without dismissiveness, have that conversation. Anyway, that, that to me is, is a useful thought experiment of like, how does Claude talk to a flat earth believer and still teach them something, still grow, help them grow, that kind of stuff. That's yeah. that's challenging. And, and kind of like walking that line between convincing someone and just trying to like talk at them versus like drawing out their views, like listening and then offering kind of counter considerations. Um, and it's hard. I think it's actually a hard line where it's like, where are you trying to convince someone versus just offering them like considerations and things for them to think about so that you're not actually like influencing them. You're just like letting them reach wherever they reach. And that's like a line that it's, it's difficult, but that's the kind of thing that language models have to try and do. So, like I said, you've had a lot of conversations with Claude. 
Can you just map out what those conversations are like? What are some memorable conversations? What's the purpose, the, the goal of those conversations? Yeah, I think that most of the time when I'm talking with Claude, I'm trying to kind of map out its behavior in part. Like obviously I'm getting like helpful outputs from the model as well. But in some ways this is like how you get to know a system, I think, is by like probing it and then augmenting like, you know, the message that you're sending and then checking the response to that. Um, so in some ways it's like how I map out the model. Uh, I think that people focus a lot on these quantitative evaluations of models. Um, and this is a thing that I've said before, but I think in the case of language models, a lot of the time each interaction you have is actually quite high information. Um, it's very predictive of other interactions that you'll have with the model. And so I guess I'm like, if you talk with a model hundreds or thousands of times, this is almost like a huge number of really high quality data points about what the model is like. Um, in a way that like, lots of very similar but lower quality conversations just aren't or like questions that are just like mildly augmented and you have thousands of them might be less relevant than like a hundred really well selected questions let's see you're talking to somebody who as a hobby does a podcast i agree with you 100 percent. there's a if you're able to ask the right questions and are able to hear like understand the <laughs> like the depth and the flaws in the answer, mm -hmm. you can get a lot of data from that. Yeah. So like your task is basically how to probe with questions. Yeah. And you're exploring like the long tail, the edges, the edge cases, or are you looking for like general behavior? I think it's almost like everything. Like I can, because I want like a full map of the model, I'm kind of trying to do, um, the whole spectrum of possible interactions you could have with it. So like one thing that's interesting about Claude, and this might actually get to some interesting issues with RLHF, which is if you ask Claude for a poem, like I think that a lot of models, if you ask them for a poem, the poem is like fine. You know, usually it kind of like <laughs> yeah. rhymes and it's, you know, so if you say like, give me a poem about the sun, it'll be like, yeah, it'll just be a certain length. It'll like rhyme. It'll be fairly kind of benign. Um, and I've wondered before, is it the case that what you're seeing is kind of like the average? It turns out, you know, if, if you think about people who have to talk to a lot of people and be very charismatic, one of the weird things is that I'm like, well, they're kind of incentivized to have these extremely boring views. Because if you have really interesting views, you're divisive. Um, and, and not, you know, a lot of people are not going to like you. So like if you have very extreme policy positions, I think you're just going to be like less popular as a politician, for example. Um, and it might be similar with like creative work. If you produce creative work that is just trying to maximize the kind of number of people that like it, you're probably not going to get as many people who just absolutely love it um, because it's going to be a little bit, you know, you're like, oh, this is the out. Yeah, this, this is decent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so you can do this thing where like I have various prompting things that I'll do to get Claude to, I'm kind of, you know, I'll, I'll do a lot of like, this is your chance to be like fully creative. I want you to just think about this for a long time. And I want you to like create a poem about this topic that is really expressive of you, both in terms of how you think poetry should be structured, um, et cetera. You know, and you just give it this like really long prompt. And its poems are just so much better. Like they're really good. And I don't think I'm someone who is like, um, I think it got me interested in poetry, which I think was interesting. Um, you know, I would like read these poems and just be like, this is, I just like, I love the imagery. I love like, um, and it's not trivial to get the models to produce work like that, but when they do, it's like really good. Um, so I think that's interesting that just like encouraging creativity and for them to move away from the kind of like standard, like immediate reaction that might just be the aggregate of what most people think is fine uh, can actually produce things that, at least to my mind, are probably a little bit more divisive, but I like them. But I guess a poem is a nice, clean way to observe creativity. It's just like easy to detect vanilla versus non-vanilla. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. 